Okay, everyone, we'll get started in about three minutes. We're just gonna let um, everyone get logged in and settled in. You see, you get to just look at us. <laughs> Hello, Connor McGinnis. I knew that was you logging in. Do you like my sweatshirt? <laughs> no comment. Just a ha ha, no comment at all. That says Ola. It doesn't even say a nope, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we know you can hear us. Hi, Kim Edgecomb. I was gonna um, tell a joke earlier today and I wasn't sure if it was appropriate and my litmus test was, would Kim Edgecomb laugh at it? And I thought you would and so I went with it. So you're my litmus test if it's an okay off color joke or if I need to not tell it. Are you telling the joke here? No, oh. it's not appropriate for here. <laughs> okay. I at least know that. <laughs> Just kidding. Hey, Lance, it's good to see you. We are not good with time-sensitive projects around here, Lance. Yeah, we run late all the time. <laughs> backwards. It does look a little backwards, mm -hmm. doesn't it? I can pick up the camera and hold it toward you too. That's okay. It'll be all right. You're such a diva. <laughs> Well, getting assigned to a bigger project's a good thing, Lance. Mm -hmm. Just see if it pushes you later, right? <laughs> when I'm at work, I'm like the complete opposite. I'm like, as soon as they give me a project, I have to have it done. And everyone's always like, quit being an overachiever. Like you, you have a week to do that. You don't have to do it today, but I have to have it done. But then I don't know what happens when I get home. I just lose all motivation. <clears throat> I'm a princess. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Connor. Oh, you tried to read the books and you failed. He'll hold them up for yeah. a longer amount of time. Yep, I was just testing. And I'm going to play secretary tonight. So as he holds up the books, I will type their names in the comments. <laughs> so just a warning to, I, I think we've told Connor this, but we have a TV running softly in our background. If it's interfering, just let us know and we will shut it down. You want to go ahead and get started, Bill? Yeah. Okay. I think so. It's time. 
Well, everybody, just want to say thanks for joining us tonight. And this is the second installment of um, I'm a Christian, now what? And so last week, Katie and I spent a little bit of time and just talked about our testimonies and um, just our journeys and how we got to where we are. And then tonight's topic is um, how to read your Bible. And for me, this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, and we'll just kind of walk through some various things uh, that's really important, I feel like, for Bible reading. But what I wanted to do was just kind of turn it over to Katie a little bit and um, have her um, talk a little bit about her experience with reading the Bible, what she uses for some resources, and just her experience with it. So, so here you go. <laughs> Bill, I like to call Bill a Bible scholar. He knows his not true. Bible like... <laughs> front to back. Um, when I first told him, I said, we were taking a trip to Las Vegas and I'm like, I'm going to get a tattoo when we're in Las Vegas. And he goes, what does the Bible say about getting a tattoo? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and he's like, don't you think you should know what the Bible says before you go and do something? And so I like did the research, looked it up and I was like, okay, so the Bible says, you know, do not mark your body for um, remembrance of the dead. And I'm like, I'm actually getting Christian tattoo and he's the living God, so he's not dead. And, and you know, and everything mentioned is in the Old Testament. So I really think it's okay. And he's like, I don't care if you get a tattoo. And I'm like, <laughs> then why did you do that? And he's like, cause you should know what your Bible says about it. So that's what I'm living with. Y'all have three pages of notes he's going through tonight. And, and that's actually an excellent point about context. We'll be talking some about context, but that's really a good example. So, um, yeah. So you've got, you guys have your work cut out for you tonight. <laughs> I, on the other hand, as we talked about last um, week, grew up Christian where you don't open your Bible. You put it in a drawer. It's tucked away. Ben, can you not do that right behind us, please? Thanks, no, sweetie. Um, you don't open it. And so it, it still is really hard for me to, um, to um, you know, just open the Bible and understand what it says. I remember when I was little having these signs in my room, and I'll probably even quote this scripture wrong, um, and they said, like, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He um, leadeth me, um, you know, along That's still so waters. And I'm like, I remember reading that, and maketh, leadeth, like, what is that? And so even now, like, I just struggle with some of that stuff. And so one thing I wanted to point out, and we're using my phone for the live. So let me see if I can get it pulled up on bills because I was going to show you. Um, most of you probably know that we use the Bible app um, for a lot of the Bible studies at um, CF. Um, Reveal. <laughs> reveal that we're um, doing right now. And that's the Bible app that we use. And that's really helpful because you can basically look at every translation. So if you're reading something that doesn't really make sense to you, you can pull it up in another translation and maybe it'll be in English as I like to call it. Um, and that Bible app is Bible app, daily study, audio, and prayer. And within that Bible app. Also, there's plans that you can do, which um, we're doing through Reveal right now. There's um, a verse of the day you can have texted or emailed to you. There are prayer lists that you can um, type out and keep on that Bible app. So that's like a super handy um, way to use your Bible because it's right here. You always have your phone with you. And also you can kind of change the version so that you can, you can actually read and understand um, <clears throat> maybe what you're trying to learn about. And then I also use a lot of different devotionals, which I have um, them that I will also put in the comments. And um, I have a link where you can purchase them too. It's a Christian bookstore that a friend of mine um, manages. And basically there's several, but the one I like the most is um, called Jesus Calling. A lot of you may have heard of it. It's um, written by Sarah Young. And what she basically does is so those... Um, those scriptures, he maketh me to uh, lie down in green pastures. Um, her her version of it might say something like, you know, I'm, she talks in God, you know, in God's voice, I made you to relax and enjoy nature. Um, 
you know, he leads me by still waters. You're, you know, don't be anxious. I'm with you. So it kind of like it's, you know, you can read it more in like God is speaking to you. A lot of times when I read the Bible, I feel like I read it and I think, but, the, but he's not talking to me. That was what he was saying to, you know, X, Y, Z. And so it's hard for me to kind of put it, what I'm reading to, you know, actual um, life perspective. And so that really helps. And then also, um, like we talked last week and I was not very good in my Bible when Bill and I first met and he maybe teased me a little bit. Um, <laughs> so what I did is I, he had an old teen study Bible that he had kept for years and years and years and years and years from when he was a teenager. And, um, I would read that. It was a um, teen study life application Bible. And so it would, you know, it, the um, verses were in very common English. They also then had um, little screenshots of like, you know, John. this is the book of John and here's who John is and here's how he grew up. And then it would maybe have um, like a real life teenager saying, you know, this is something I went through and I relate it to this, this way. And so that's really how I went from like no Bible knowledge to kind of understanding or at least getting to a point where I felt like I could make sense of some of what I was reading and move on. So don't be, you know, if you aren't getting it or if you feel like you're not getting what you should be getting out of it, don't be afraid to look at different resources. Don't be afraid to look at a different Bible version. There are so many out there. And if you're reading New King James and maybe you need to be in, you know, more of a New Living Translation, so what? Like, don't feel like you need to read a certain kind because that's what Bill's reading and he makes fun of you. Um, just, <laughs> just read what, wow. yeah, just to read what works for you um, and what you can understand and what you feel like God can speak to you through. And I think that's about all I have because really Bill's the Bible scholar. <laughs> Sorry for what he's about to put you through. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I, I would say that that's not true, but um, uh this is really, like I said before, as I started out, this is really a topic to me that's near and dear to my heart. And, and I think, especially when you're looking at it from the standpoint of, I'm a Christian, now what? I think, you know, um, a couple of very important questions is, well, why should you read your Bible? You know, what is it that it does for you? And um, really, I think there's a couple of different answers to that. One is, you get to learn more about God, and you understand his story, and it's an incredible story. Um, we start off with the book of Genesis, and we have creation, and then we work our way through to God's um, selecting a group of people, the Israelites, and giving them the law, and then we find that um, they're not able to keep the law, and this Old Testament now is pointing to the New Testament and to the Messiah, and then we start off the, the New Testament with the Gospels, and we um, have four different perspectives with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, to learn more about Jesus. And then we see his death and resurrection. And then we see Paul's letters. And at the very end of the book, we see um, the book of Revelation, which is an amazing book. And we'll talk just really briefly about that a little bit later. But that's the end of the story where we see um, the return of the Messiah. Jesus returns and um, restores his kingdom. And um, we live with him forever. So it's just this incredible story and I would also say another reason for reading the Bible is really it's the uh, ultimate instruction manual for how we are to live as new creatures in Christ. What so, did Jeff Comstock used to call it for the Woodward boys? Basic instructions before leaving earth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeff always had some really cool, mm -hmm. some really cool Ways things to remember to, and... yeah. But, you know, there are times that we think that we know better. Um, we, we may think, wow, the Bible was written, you know, a long time ago, right? Over 2,000 years ago. And we may think, you know, that's not relative to us. But to be honest with you, it is the living word. And um, nobody knows us more intimately than God. And as his creator <laughs> and his wanting us to um, be fruitful and um, have happy lives, um, this is really an instruction manual for all time. And I would say the final point is, 
it continues to draw us closer to God. And as we continue to learn from these pages and are guided by the Holy Spirit, we continue to be conformed to his image. And that is a lifelong process. You know, a lot a change doesn't happen a lot of times overnight, but there's a lot that God reveals through us uh, to us through the words of the Bible and through the Holy Spirit. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, really about the context of the Bible. And, you know, as I shared with you guys last week, and as Katie said, I've got about two pages of notes to go through. Connor, I'm really going to try and uh, watch my time this time, but I'm going to zip through some of this stuff. But, you know, growing up in a church, we had some really legalistic teachings. And so for us, we kept the Sabbath from sundown Friday and sundown Saturday. And I'm sorry if I'm repeating some of this, but again, I just kind of want you to understand the context of where I came from and why this topic is so important to me. Um, we observed a lot of the special holy days, the Jewish holy days, like Passover, Pentecost, Days of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Tabernacles. Um, we kept the dietary laws of Leviticus. Um, yet, it was really interesting when I kind of look back on it, we actually kind of weaseled our way out of keeping the whole law. So, for example, if you read in James 2.10, he clearly says, if you break one of those laws, you actually are guilty of breaking the whole law. Well, in our theology, we really chose not to address that because we thought if we kept the main ones, we would be good. So we did this kind of pick and choose type of abiding the law. And the reason we did that was we believed our leader, Herbert W. Armstrong, was an apostle of the end times. And his central belief was, I don't know if you've heard of this before, but it was a doctrine called British Israelism. And according to this doctrine, the 10 lost tribes of Israel found their way to Western Europe and to Britain. Uh, and they became the ancestors of the British and related peoples. So Mr. Armstrong believed that he was an apostle um, to these lost 10 tribes of Israel, and he was um, commissioned to explain the prophecies to them. So by accepting him, as an end-time apostle, that meant we had great faith in him, and we didn't uh, proof text his material. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a cult. <laughs> so, and that's exactly what we were. Um, uh, you can get into a lot of trouble by putting greater faith in a man than the Word of God, and that's exactly what we did because we believe that he was an end-time apostle. We didn't really question him. We didn't uh, read uh, other parts of our Bible that we kind of shoved off to the side, like Corinthians and Galatians. And when we did read from those books, um, we uh, had a really limited understanding, and we tried to conform those into some different texts. So as I began to study some of our old teachings, as I was coming back into church, I began to understand we had some grave errors with our theology, and this took me a long time to unpack a lot of this, but we were using the lens of the law uh, and works to read the Bible, and instead, what we should have been doing is using Jesus as our lens to interpret and understand Scripture. And so this brings me to my first point. We must be aware of what influences our reading of the Bible. This is so critical, and there's a few of them that I, I kind of want to point out and talk to you about. You know, obviously for me, it was previous teachings and understandings. So I had worked myself into a system of understanding that I really had to unravel a lot of things to get back uh, into mainstream Christianity and understand um, why mainstream Christianity believed what they did. So for me, just having previous teachings and, and my background was really a challenge, and I had to work through a lot in that. Also, another thing that uh, can influence our reading is even current cultural norms, right? And so, for example, if you take a look at the topic of homosexuality, that is a hot topic right now. And literally, it's splitting the Methodist church right in half. And along with that topic... You know, we may have some personal biases, too. Like we, um, because of our culture, because of our upbringing, we may firmly believe that um, homosexuality is okay, or we may firmly believe that homosexuality is not okay. And what we do is we may 
because we want to prove either one way or the other, we may read scripture and that may blind what the Holy Spirit has for us because we're more intent on proving than we are learning or understanding. So my point is we need to really uh, be able to wipe that slate clean. Um, my recommendation anytime that you're getting ready to read the Bible is just to invite the Holy Spirit into your scripture reading and I think that's such an important piece to just clear your mind. Um, you know, Brenda McGinnis had talked about inviting God into areas of your life, and that's always stuck with me. And inviting the Holy Spirit into um, helping you understand and to read Scripture is just an amazing piece. And I also wanted to talk about another story that um, uh, Larry gave about Edgy. And I, I just thought this was the neatest story, but, you know, often... Kim and Edgy would <clears throat> come up and spend the night with Brenda and, and Larry over the weekend. And Larry just talked about how he would get up in the morning and, you know, he'd go to, to the kitchen and there Edgy would be and he'd be in his chair. And, and uh, Larry wasn't really sure if Edgy was awake or if he was asleep or what was going on. And, and uh, <clears throat> they kind of talked about it at one point and Edgy said, I'm just here listening. I'm just listening for what God might have for me. And, he wasn't trying to. Um, he wasn't trying to run the conversation. He wasn't praying for anything specific at the time, but he was just waiting in silence. And I thought, man, how powerful is that? Because so many times when I approach God, I have an agenda. I have something that I want to talk to Him about, and yet Edgy during this time, a lot of times was just waiting in silence for whatever God had for him. And I really use that as a correlation to we have to look at Scripture like that. What does God have for us? And can we take a lot of those things that maybe we've used to interpret the Bible in the past <clears throat> and let those fall away and let him really teach and guide us? And I always say that I think that sometimes <clears throat> the Bible is hard to understand or hard to interpret purposefully because what God may be writing to me at this point in my life is something different than what he's writing to you in your point of, in your point of life. And so... I may interpret it differently, but that may be how God intended it for me to understand at that time. And so <coughs> sometimes going in there, you know, without a preconceived notion of what you should be reading or what you are reading or what you want to read, it's better to kind of just go in there, like Bill said, with a blank slate and be able to take what's there for you. So another piece that I wanted to talk about is as you're getting started with your reading your Bible, you know, you have this big book and it can be pretty intimidating. And one thing I think that's really important about understanding is there's actually different genres within the Bible. Um, so I, I, I'm kind of doing this for fun and it's kind of silly, but I just want to give you an example of what I mean by that. <clears throat> and I'm going to pull out some examples of our American culture. So when I talk about different genres, I mean, there's different types of writing and there's different types of styles of writing. And when you instantly see them, you know whether, for example, to take them seriously or whether you should be really studious when reading them. Um, but let me give you an example. So, and I know this is probably going to be backwards, <laughs> but <clears throat> here's um, the globe. And it says, killer hornets take U.S. by swarm. And I don't know about you, but every time I step outside, I've got just a swarm of these around my head. That's not actually true. But if you've seen the Globe or you've seen the National Enquirer, you kind of have an idea of how to read these, right? <clears throat> maybe some entertainment value. Maybe there's a little bit of news, but um, maybe as uh, Donald Trump says, President Trump, fake news. I'm going to read those later. Yeah, she's going to take those. Here's one of my favorites, and this is, again, kind of silly, but it's Calvin and Hobbes, right? You don't read a comic book or you don't read um, this the same way that you would read a newspaper. Or maybe like you would read something informational. Here's a book that I have on Suze Orman. So when I read her, I'm paying attention pretty closely and I'm trying to learn from her. So I read this a little bit differently than what I would read Calvin and Hobbes. So... You have to understand within the Bible, there are different types of literature as well. So, for example, the Gospels are historical narrative. Um, they're told from four different uh, points of view. 
<clears throat> and you'll see that they have different audiences. So, for example, Matthew starts out with a long genealogy. And Well, why does he do that? Well, because he's trying, his audience is mainly the Jewish people, and he's showing the lineage of how Christ is the Messiah. And so you, you see things like that, and it's really helpful to understand who the audience is and under the circumstances with which he's writing. The epistles, or um, the writings of Paul, are actually letters. So these are to individual churches, <clears throat> and they're written to an intended group of people at a certain time frame. And a lot of times, um, Paul has, there's a reason for why he's, he's writing what he's writing. So for example, the book of Galatians, um, there, are some, there are some people that are coming back uh, after the Galatians and talking about they need to conform with areas of the law. And so the whole premise of the book of Galatians is fighting that. And so it's helpful to understand, you know, the circumstances in the audience. The Psalms are poetry. So you wouldn't read poetry or you wouldn't read the book of Psalms the same way that you would read um, the Gospels or the book of Revelation. And speaking of Revelation, what is that book? Because if you ever start to read that and you don't have any context, it's literally mind-blowing because it's got all these different symbols and it's got all of these kind of, it's a different style of writing. Um, you see glimpses of it back in Daniel and some of the prophecies, but it can really be a challenging book. And when you think about the book of Revelation, it's actually a couple of different things. One, it's a letter. It's John specifically writing to the seven churches, and it's at a specific point of time. And so he's warning um, of, he's warning the believers at that time of things that will be happening because he starts out and says, these events will be happening soon. Now, I would imagine if you could go back in time and ask John and Paul and some other authors of the Bible that if we would, you know, be looking at some of these events 2,000 years ahead of time, that that would really surprise them. So it's important to remember the time frame and the context of which they're speaking. The other thing about Revelation is it's apocalyptic literature. So if you haven't, if you don't understand ap apocalyptic literature or how it was used at that time, it would be good to, to get a little bit of understanding around that. No one's probably going to be like, welcome to the church. Here's your Bible. Start in Revelation. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it, just not for the lighthearted. Or yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's a, it can be. A, it's deep and dark and there's a lot make to a it. lot of sense if you're not. <clears throat> kind of, if you don't kind of know the background that yeah. led up to it, you don't s typically start at the back of the book anyway, you yeah. know, and read forwards. But so. it is, it is a story of victory. So, all right, I'm, I'm making pretty good time. I have about a page left with about four minutes to go. I may, I'm probably not going to get Holy it done in four moly. minutes, but we've already talked that long. Yeah. <clears throat> so understanding there's different genres um, the next step really is just getting started, right? Um, my recommendation to people, if and whenever they ask, is um, to start in the Gospels. Um, I particularly love the book of John. I think it's one of the easier books to read. But I think just understanding um, and reading the stories about Jesus and seeing how he acted um, and his characteristics in the stories, I, I think is a great way to start off. Um and I would also say, don't be afraid, as Katie was talking about, don't be afraid to tap into some, some resources. Uh, I wanted to share with you a few of the resources that, um, that I share. And uh, either while I'm going along or maybe at the end, Katie will um, type these into the chat if you're interested in them. And one thing I'll, I'll mention too, you know, these are my personal favorites. I highly recommend them but they may not be for, for you. And um, if you ever have any questions or would, would have um, a recommendation for me, or if you would like to ask my advice, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, you're always free to use books out of my inventory. And I would even say this um, and offer this, I haven't told this to Katie, but you know, especially with all the COVID stuff going on, um, I know that money can be an issue, but if, if you're interested in some of these resources and would like a copy of it, just let me know. I would be more than happy to get one for you because, again, this, this stuff is so important to me. 
Um, but these were some resources that I used that kind of helped me unwind my previous theology and get me going on the right track. So this first book, and again, I know that it's backwards, but this is a, um, a book that I really uh, started to read, and it helped me with some of the overall themes um, of the book. It's called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Um, it's by Gordon Fee and uh, Douglas Stewart. So it has... Um, one thing that I really liked about this, because I, I don't know a lot about the different translations that are out there, but it has an overview of the translations. Some people really like um, a version of the Bible that is um, maybe has uh, kind of the older language, like a New King James, some like the freer language, and so it actually has a chart in it that kind of shows you, based on the different versions, you know, how they may have a freer language or they may have one that's closer to the King James. So, and, and, I, <clears throat> yeah. and, lead <laughs> and I feel like that's important to find a translation that's good for you. It talks about things like parables, understanding what they are and their use, talks about the law from kind of a general perspective. So it just kind of gives you a good framework of some of the major themes and the ma and some of the major topics that you might find in the Bible. So um, it's, and, and it's a pretty easy read. The second book that I would recommend is also by Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. And this one is How to Read the Bible Book by Book. And I have really, uh, again, enjoyed this book. The thing I love about it is um, it gives a really short explanation. So, for example, it talks about who the author is, talks about the time frame it was written in, and uh, it gives you an overview of the book. And really the overview is like half a page. So it's not this long in-depth read. It's kind of short, really to the point. And then it also gives you some specific advice for reading the book. And, and this may be a little bit longer, but the thing I love about these is it doesn't, it doesn't tell you how to interpret the book, but what it tells you to do is it tells you to watch for some major themes. So it has a section where it talks about the overview and then what it will do is it kind of breaks it up in chunks um, of, of scripture. So you may read like, for example, I'm looking at uh, Amos right now. And it's got, um, it's got a section from chapter 1, uh, verse 3 to 216. And it's just one paragraph that says, hey, this is what this section is about, how it kind of ties into the other sections in the rest of the book. So really, really helpful in understanding context and um, explaining the flow of the books. I've just really enjoyed this. On my opinion is this book <clears throat> is way more highlighted than this book. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say this is Bill's favorite. Yeah. Those are my two cents. Um, this, this final one that I'll show you, this is one that I use a lot um, when doing Bible studies, either presenting them or doing personal Bible studies. I used to not be a big history fan, but um, this is a series called the New Daily Study Bible, and it's by William Barclay. And this is kind of how to read the Bible book by book, a little bit more on steroids. So it goes a lot more into the historical context. There's literally a book for each book. Yeah. So this this whole volume is just um, on, it's actually only volume one of the Gospel of John. And so there's two volumes. So you may have, you know, five or six pages on one, on one, uh, uh, one little pericope or when I say pericope, I mean, that's one little section in scripture, but I've found this extremely valuable too, to go a little bit deeper. And these aren't necessarily meant to be read cover to cover either. It's more to go along with what you're reading in your Bible. You can grab one of these and um, kind of try and make sense of it or study deeper, but it's not like you have to read this whole book and the second volume and then also, you know, end your Bible and, you know, you want to start with your Bible and then focus on one of these books to help. Yep. And so again, those are just some resources that I've used in the past. Uh, I just realized I skipped a little section, but it's okay because it ties into this really well. You know, when thinking about the context of the Bible, the authors of the books uh, did not start out with like chapter one, verse one. These writings were actually organized into long strings of thought. And so literally, when you think of a scroll, that's what it looked like. 
the verses and the chapters were, were really put into place long afterwards to be used as points of reference. You know, so we don't, for example, we don't read a newspaper and start in the middle of an article. Just think if like right now we were like, go to second, your second scroll and unscroll it because that's really what you'd be doing if nobody had done this. If you think reading the Bible is complicated, imagine if you were, you know, trying to go through all the scrolls yeah. with no reference numbers and no guides to help you. And, and we could never understand the full context of the story if we just read two or three sentences in the middle of the article. So, you know, with the church that I grew up in, we really didn't pay a lot of attention to context. So we would pull a verse or two from one book and a verse or two from another book, and we could prove just about anything. And again, this is kind of a silly example, but you could look in, you know, Matthew 27, verse 5, where it says, Judas hanged himself. And then you could go to Luke 10, 37 and read, go thou and do likewise. I mean, totally ridiculous, right? You would never do that. But I say that because when you do a topical study, Sometimes there's danger in saying, oh, well, I'm going to talk about joy or I'm going to talk about <clears throat> um, the rapture or I'm going to talk about heaven and hell. And so you may, because you're doing a topical study, you may be in trying to pull verses out of different um, books of the Bible. You have to be very careful that your point is supported by the scripture and the context with which it's written in. I know once I started to understand that, I went from more of a topical study to both in my preaching and my study in just taking a passage of scripture and saying, okay, let's talk about, you know, how this speaks, speaks to us today. So uh, again, just another piece about how to be very um, careful about the context, because you really have to see what is the verse saying in context to the verses immediately around it. And how do the context of the verses even fit within the chapter? And how, how does the verses fit within the, the, whole, um, the whole book? That is like Bill's main sticking point, I want to say, is anytime, you know, you say something about the Bible and he'll be like, well, what is the context? Like every time he doesn't want you just to take, I shouldn't say you, me, he doesn't want me to just take, you know, one verse or one sentence and be like, but it says this. And then he'll be like, yeah, but what does the context say? What's around that verse? And so I think from, you know, just learning from him, it's important not to just, if someone just says, well, the Bible says, and then you're like, oh, okay, well, you know, Pastor Larry said that's what the Bible says. I believe Pastor Larry, but, and I'm not saying not to believe Pastor Larry, but you want to be the one who goes and looks at th that passage and read around it and really get the context because you can trust Pastor Larry, but Joe Blow down the street maybe you can. And so you want to make sure you get used to kind of studying that out. I used to give Bill a lot of crap for that. Like he'd be like, I'd be like, Oh, did you hear when so-and-so said this? And he'd be like, no. And I'm like, well, if you weren't trying to prove them wrong, but I dig in through their scriptures and he's like, I wasn't trying to prove them wrong. I just wanted to see the whole picture. So, I mean, there's just, you just have to study it out and make sure you yeah. have the full picture. And I, I wanted to add to, you know, bringing up Pastor Larry, um, I've heard him say many times from the pulpit, you know, get in there and read it yourself. Make don't sure you, don't yeah. believe me. Go in and read it yourself. And that is so important for me to hear. And I, I just, you know, there's so many wonderful aspects about our pastor, but that, you know, during the course of this conversation, that is one thing that he has challenged the congregation to do on many times. So um, you know, we really just have to get in and read. So... Um, but I see that we are at 8.53, which, uh, over know, again. How much over is that? Uh, it's not bit. my fault this time. <laughs> but I, I would also say too, you know, there, there are a lot of great commentaries out there. There's a lot of great dictionaries. Those things will help. But I would also just emphasize again, even with all of this other help, I really feel like just inviting the Holy Spirit in and, and just to help you with understanding is the number one thing you can do. Well, and one other thing is too, you know, like Bill, um, when we first kind of started going to church, he introduced me to what a concordance was. And so like, if there's a scripture, you're like, oh, that scripture, you know, I know this word was in it, but I can't remember where and what. 
you know, you can turn, it's almost like a dictionary. You can turn to that word in the concordance and it'll show you where that word is everywhere in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Where was I going with this? Oh, now we have Google, right? So we can Google passages with the word and it's going to pull up. But that's another place where you want to be careful of your context because anyone can be posting, you know, oh, it says this in the Bible, you know, online too. And, and when you're looking through Google, so because I've looked up things before and got and you know and gotten into this group and I'm like this is not at all what I think and then I realize <laughs> I'm in like a totally different religions like you know paraphrasing of that of that scripture I was looking for so while it's nice to not have to carry around a concordance everywhere you go <laughs> you still want to be careful when you're googling or when you're trying to research online kind of where what's the word I'm looking for your source you want to watch your source and make sure you've got a, a valid source and a credit a credible source yep so i just find it interesting that now we're running late yeah i and this is actually <laughs> to that point i just find it interesting that this week bill comes to the table with three pages of notes where's the timer <laughs> i don't see a timer well, actually, I thought it was because you weren't going to be speaking oh, as yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, again, I, I would just offer if if there's anything that we can do to help you with your resources, um, we would be more than happy to do that. And uh, I wanted to close um, by saying next week we'll be talking about how to get involved. And that may be getting involved in your local church. Uh, as a new believer and uh, also in the community as well. So we'll have some stories about that and talk about getting into that. But I, I, Katie wants to say something, but I'm going to close by saying um, we love you all and thank you so much for watching. And again, if you have any questions or need any information, let us know. <laughs> Holly. So, Holly, ask us a question. What's that? What, she said, keep going, please. But oh. I don't know what to keep going about. <laughs> we can keep arguing. We're really good at that in prompt. And that in is prompt entertainment. Too. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be back next week with more. Wolverine's cool. That's what, that's what Wolverine's Ben has cool. to say. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good ending. Kim says, hi, Ben. <laughs> and Karen sent you a heart. Yep. You are really popular. You are. Popular well, some night we'll just um, set up the camera and let Bill or let Ben go for it. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, <laughs> thanks, everybody. Everyone. We love you. Have a good night.